How is everybody doing? Strength Chat episode 84 and today I have got a very special guest for you. Today I am joined by a coach at Reactive Training Systems. He delivers seminars around the world and in all honesty he's just a really cool guy. Today I am joined by Jim Ellie. How are you doing? What is up Stephen? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I uh, just got done actually traveling as you mentioned it from the EPC. Though, unfortunately, I was just there listening, which actually was a pretty awesome change of pace because, like you said, I have been doing seminars around the world for the last year or so, and I I really love uh, presenting, and I really love being kind of being the person to to share my ideas, but it's it, while I was doing that, I thought it would be really interesting to kind of be on the other end of things, so... Uh, the EPC, if none of you guys have been to it, highly recommend checking it out, mostly just because of the, the discussion between the the speakers, like, you know, Eric Helms, Mike Deshear, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, uh, Mike Ezraetel, Brett Gibbs, and I keep forgetting, it's Gabriella, Gabriella, uh, her Instagram is vitamin PhD, but yeah, that was really, really fun, so I'm just getting back from that, um, which is awesome. Yeah, was that that was in London um, this year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was pretty close to the city center, like in the financial district. So yeah. it's kind of fun. Because I know, I think I know the year before. Um, the I think it was in uh, it was in Ireland. I can't remember whether it was in Belfast or Dublin, but um, I know a couple of other coaches that um, or I've seen a couple of other coaches have, have been there. Um, and yeah, to say that I think it's only the, the two years that it's been running um, that the um, it's become really really popular and it's been a, a recommended as a good event to go. You know, to to listen to the speakers that are that are speaking from there, and you know, you don't always get the um, coaches like that having the chance to speak to speak to each other sort of in person uh, if you like which um you know would be really really good. so uh, yeah i'll definitely keep my keep my out for that when it's uh, <laughs> Steven, where were you why were you there come on man <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah it's um yeah bit of a bit of a drive from uh, from uh, from leeds to london yeah being in the being in the north of england it's uh, we don't usually venture down south <laughs> oh i didn't realize you were in leeds yeah, in there, uh, based it based in Leeds, um, and then yeah, got a nice close. Uh, so this year I'll be competing in my second um, British Championships for powerlifting. Um, so uh, last year it was in Portsmouth, right down at the bottom end of the country. This year I've got another nice close competition, and it's all the way down in Dover. So oh my goodness, man! <laughs> um, you guys, I feel like you guys, even though like it's just an island in the UK, like the 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 distance, like. It's not even the distance, but the time it takes to get from the top to the bottom and then the actual expense it is compared to like, if I were to drive from the top of my state down to the bottom of it, it I don't know, take like a few hours, it would cost like $30. Whereas for you guys, isn't it like, I don't know, 100 euros or something to get from the oh, top? Oh, the, the, to get the trains down to, to London or, or anything like that is um, is just is just crazy. Um, everywhere Everywhere else. Um, I've I've been. I mean, I even I, I lived in Australia for a little bit, and the, to get around there, bearing in mind it might take twelve hours to get to another. Yeah, I think we drove from um, Melbourne to Sydney, and it was something like twelve hours, uh, and it wasn't that. It was nowhere near the um, the price that we would pay for pay for trains over here. Um, so yeah, um, but having my my card, I've only got a small. It's like a little clown car, so. Um, it doesn't take that much. Uh, doesn't take that much fuel. Um, yeah, cool. So obviously mentioned you've been over to the um, to the EPC. Um, what else have you been up to? Uh, how are you doing? What What else has been going on? Um, a lot, man. So, like the start of 2019, which I guess was eight months ago. It's crazy. It seems like it was. A, I don't even know if I feel like it was further than that or closer than that, but. Um, Isabella von Weissenberg and I, we did some seminars in Australia too. Um, we were in Melbourne, did a, did a seminar at JPS Health and Fitness, then uh, hung out there for an extra week because, you know, we're in Australia and also, yeah, we're in Australia. I, I've always <laughs> wanted, like, I've always wanted to go there, like, at least, what well, I don't know, well, before I died, I guess. <laughs> to be able to go there and and talk about powerlifting um with 
the Australian powerlifting community, which is really awesome, by the way. If you guys happen to, if any of you are Australian listening to this, just know that there's a special place for you in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, and then we did one in Sydney like two weeks later, and then I went over to hang out with Brett Gibbs in New Zealand for like two weeks in Wellington, New Zealand. Nice. Which I like haven't seen a lot of nature in the last few months you know i've you know, like it's a lot of farms and, and and trees and stuff but in new zealand it, like waking up in the morning to like any like literally you just open your eyes and it's just like every color that you want you know like super blue water super beautiful trees and animals and sounds and anyway I, i've been daydreaming about that a lot recently and then we did a seminar up in the north uh, in, in auckland and then yeah, like long story short, I came back to Australia for for about a month, and then came came back home. Uh, I don't care. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if anyone cares about my my like real like TMI type of thing, but I had to get my tonsils removed, um, <laughs> like in the middle of April, which was not exactly something I was expecting. But <laughs> I'm glad that like a part of my throat was removed and I didn't like just die. I don't know how that works. <laughs> you, know, you get like the entire piece of your body just taken out and it's like, yeah, yeah it'll be like a two week recovery time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I did, yeah. I don't know. I did that and then came back to, or sorry, you're going to say something. Uh, no, I was just going to say the first person I know you hear about people getting their tonsils out, but yeah, the first person I know to have their tonsils, tonsils removed. So um, that's a, fir- that's a first for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. That was a crazy, crazy thing. Um, took a few weeks to recover. Um, then, yeah, went to Worlds 2019 in Sweden, and that was incredible. Coaching, coaching my athletes at the U- in the UK uh, and France. It was kind of funny. It was just like pretty much I was Team UK, Team France, and um, <laughs> everyone was like, "Who are you?" And I'm like, "Oh no, nah, just shh, don't tell anybody." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. nice. That's been my summer pretty much. Um, and then <clears throat> because you asked, I just can't not answer everything, you know. <clears throat> I also, then after that, I went over to Mike Tushier's, uh place in, in Holland, and we've been recording for the RTS classroom. We've kind of been revamping that um, to kind of give better, better, more updated information, better quality, 4K, uh, better audio, all that. So it's like more enjoyable entirely for the, the students. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, just touching on what you said there about New Zealand and saying how nice it is. That's the sort of the, um, yeah, uh, I'd be, having lived in Australia, I always wanted to get over to New Zealand, but um, just never never got the chance. But everyone who said said it's, you know, absolutely, absolutely awesome. And in terms of the work that um, you're doing with uh, with RTS, yeah, the, the content that's being put in out there is, um, I know I follow it and yeah, it is really, really helpful. So um, yeah, just keep, keep putting that out. <laughs> oh, dude, that, honestly, that makes me feel so good because I've like, that was my goal for this quarter was to like to, to get, get everything more enjoyable, more watchable, more shareable, just like as much as possible. And um, it requires a lot more logistical planning and, and things like that, but it's super worth it to hear um, yeah. people say they enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously you've spoken a little bit about your, uh, your summer there, uh, and mentioning about the worlds and, you know, the, the, uh, the athletes and powerlifters that, um, you've worked with and the success that you've had, um, for people who might not necessarily know your background, how you got involved with powerlifting and got involved with, um, you know, the RTS, uh, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself. Yeah, man. But just like you know, this is gonna this is gonna turn into Jimbo story time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got some cookies and milk behind the behind my laptop. So it's, I'm all I'm all sorted. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm just gonna start from like, I don't know, start from when I was 13. <laughs> That'll be brief though. So uh, yeah, I started like, I think when I started lifting was when I was 13 in my basement. Uh, I had like a bench press down there and my dad was always working out at home because I don't know, he's taking care of us and stuff, but I always thought that was cool. And my dad was jacked. So I'm like, oh, I want to look like him. He, he, he could do the, uh, the titty bounce, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if you're doing video, but if you're <laughs> like, I was like, everyone on iTunes and Spotify, get over to YouTube right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he would do like the titty bounce, and I'm like, that's cool. And he <laughs> he benched a lot, and I was 13. And I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. So um, so he taught me. Like you know, I I started benching pretty much. That was the only exercise uh, he felt comfortable with teaching me. And like like we had a bow flex. So we did some lat pull downs and stuff like that, but started benching. I remember the first program that I ever used was basically, I just looked up how to get stronger on bench press on Google back then, which is like not as advanced and sophisticated as now. And it was like a wiki how, uh, how do you, like a wiki how page popped up and it was like just a pyramid program, a pyramid kind of not pyramid scheme, but like a pyramid progression where you do like 65 and 75 by 65 by 5 75 by 3 85 by 2 whatever but I was like always wondering like well I don't know am I supposed to max out I'm 13 like do I just go for a single out of 10 you know <laughs> um but yeah so I, I that's kind of when I started and and relatively soon after that people were like impressed that I could bench press anything because no not that many 13 year olds are lifting weights at all because they're in sports and I wasn't that good at sports. So I was just like, ah, oh, yeah, no, I lift. Anyway, that kind of sparked something in me and it kind of stuck with me f- from then. And then as it got older and grew and started thinking about what I wanted to do, I always, to be honest, I never thought I would like coach powerlifting. I just mm-hmm. knew I liked teaching people what I was learning. Yeah. I would, taught my sister my younger sister how to lift whenever I was at the gym and I really liked like realizing that one she doesn't know what I know but she wants to know what I know or at least a little bit of what I know um and I love that part so that kind of started another thing in my head like oh I could get better at this because when I went to university uh I had realized that I kind of learned a decent amount about lifting weights. I wasn't excellent. I wasn't super strong, but I knew my technique was pretty solid. I was really invested in, in learning how to become a better lifter. Uh, did you ever go on bodybuilding.com? Yeah. 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 I, think, I think everyone did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I was totally on that all the time. Like my, from 15 till like 18, I was pretty much on bodybuilding.com. Uh, sending in my lifting videos, you know, doing those anonymous form checks. And I actually had, I actually got uh, developed, I don't know, got some friends, collected some, <laughs> I don't know. I got, uh, like, made some friends. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. I made some friends from that that I actually met up with in real life. And especially this one guy, um, his name is Francis. I won't use his last name in case people are like weird in Stockholm, but <laughs> uh, we ended up meeting up in like Canada, like when I was 20. Because he lives in Toronto, um, I'm getting kind of personal with this, in aren't I? <laughs> but yeah, we ended up meeting up, and he was the one guy that would give me all these technique uh, critiques, and he was learning himself, and he was stronger than me at the time too. And I just thought, wow, this is so awesome! Like, I'm online. This guy literally taught me kind of how to lift, how to squat to some degree. Like, at least gave me confidence that I'm doing something right, whether or not he was correct or not. I just thought I learned how to lift online. Like I didn't have anyone at Lifetime Fitness telling me how to how to squat, bench, or deadlift. You know, I was sending videos on the internet to other people that lifted, and that's how I learned. So um, then, fast forward to like my freshman year in university, and I was doing engineering, which it's like the thing that smart people are supposed to do. Like, oh, do engineering. You're smart. You should. Do, you can do it. And like school was pretty, pretty easy for me in high school, but I was also really good at learning patterns and like understanding the system of what, what uh, context I'm operating under. But what happened in university was that the patterns were getting way, way, way more complex. Like I did calculus and physics and engineering based physics and stuff like that. And I just realized that if I wanted to get good at this, I needed to like completely start again like math wise like really really ingrained as much as I could back into my head and um I'm incredibly social <clears throat> so I realized if I wanted to do that I would have to sacrifice a lot of my social life yeah because it was going to be a lot harder for me to restart from there than uh I needed so I ended up deciding that engineering wasn't really the move for me and my parents were like, really? Like, you got to stick with it. You got to stick with it. And 
I have nothing against it. I just, at the time, really desired developing my social skills and wanted to kind of have fun and enjoy myself and yeah. kind of develop because I couldn't see myself, <clears throat> I couldn't see myself having like a super fun time, which people are going to listen to this thing like, dude, college isn't about having fun. It's about <laughs> learning. And it totally is. I just, yeah, I just couldn't see myself doing it. So uh, I switched majors and unfortunately it wasn't anything related to what I do now. It was just a major that I could do and graduate, which was a uh, kind of a small business finance degree. Okay. But I knew that wasn't going to go anywhere. So thinking ahead while I was in this drastically easier degree or program, I started my own coaching company because again, I thought, what do I like doing? What do I love doing? What do I do all the time? What do I do when I'm not studying? Uh, what was lifting and like uh, searching PubMed. So I pretty much decided to start the process of developing a company. I started watching companies grow. Like I think at the time it was just the strength guys, the strength athlete. And I hadn't heard of reactive training systems. I think I had heard of them, but like I wasn't watching their videos or the content at that point. But, uh, yeah, so I was just like, well, somebody's done it and it's all online. Like these guys are just coaching online. I learned online. I should be able to do the same thing, you know? So I started that process and I did that for like a year and a half of just working on it and building it and, um, got up to about 15 clients on my own and was really getting into YouTube. I have a bunch of old, I have like 82 YouTube videos from like when I didn't have a nice camera and my audio was crap and, and all that. So it's kind of ironic, but, um, if you guys want to check that out, I uh, just want to, if, if anyone's listening to this thinking like I need to start a YouTube channel or I want to start coaching and they're like, Oh, but, but I'm not good at it. I'm not good at talking or I'm not good at making YouTube videos or whatever. Like go check my YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel out high fly strength systems. It's like, it's active. I don't really post to it. But my last video was made four years ago, but those videos are, they start out like horrible. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just doing this thing because it's, I was told that, I need to do it yeah. and I need to do it every day and that I don't need to worry about if they're good or not because I was like, no, they have to be good. They have to be good. And my, I had a mentor and he was like, just make the videos, man. Talk about what you want to talk about because nobody's going to watch them anyway. You have zero subscribers. Like just keep making the videos until you grow. And with that growth of and subscribers, you're also going to improve your production quality, your ability to speak and talk about whatever it is you're talking about. And, um, anyway, I did that. And then I started realizing like, I have a tendency to just kind of, I think everyone has a tendency to do this, but I kind of have a tendency to want to know the right answer and then just stick with that and then not change my mind because I stuck with it and I talked about it. So I'm, I'm kind of aware of that. And I wanted to put myself in situations where I was, at least having a conversation about a thought that I had. Yeah. So that way I wasn't just thinking, saying this is the, the way and then implementing it with my lifters. Um, I mean, I could have done that on my own, I suppose. I could have just similar with the YouTube video. Like that's a thing that evolves over time. But I just wanted to work with some other people that were doing this so that I knew I was on the right track and so that I didn't end up in four years like on my own island talking about things that are – not utilized or not helpful, not effective or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I've been talking for a while. Is there anything that you want to interject <laughs> in about? Just, uh, just with that, when you're saying about wanting to um, actually speak with other people, that's how I basically started, um, basically started the podcast. Um, the uh, people or members would ask me questions in the gym and uh, I just thought it would be cool episode one i'm going to answer answer this question and um it actually started it wasn't in the uh, the house that i'm living in now i was living in another house um and yeah basically it was just me sat on my sofa just just talking and then it got to a point where um some of the questions that were being asked weren't i didn't feel comfortable enough answering or i didn't feel as though um 
the answer that I would give would be a good enough answer for them to take information from it. The whole point of, you know, why I set it up and, and the idea, I, I had no idea it would grow to, you know, the 84th episode. Um, I just thought, right, I'm going to start reaching out to other coaches, uh, you know, who are, um, you know, more experienced and, um, uh, and have a, you know, a little, a, a bit more of a knowledge base than, than what I do for to one uh, on a selfish note for me to learn so that I can provide my members and clients with, you know, a better, a better quality service. And two, that if people are listening who I might not have any interaction with, you know, I mentioned there, somebody in Australia who I've never, I've never spoken to is listening to it and thinking, all oh, right, okay, that, that makes it, that makes, that makes a little bit more sense. Um, and some of the things I say are, um, I, I realize that I'm uh, not too far, I'm not going too far wrong. Obviously, um, as the podcast has developed, there's not just been powerlifters on the podcast. There's been other strength coaches um, in terms for just like general strength, if you like. But being a little bit more specific, I like to think I'm developing a little bit more as a as a powerlifting coach, and people are people are taking um, from it. So yeah, I completely agree that um, yeah. If you look through at some of the very first video videos here, uh, I mean, some of the podcasts, you know, are like an hour, an hour, an hour and a half long. I think my first video is is two minutes, and it's just a lots of it's just lots of um, yeah. So that's what uh, that's what I think. <laughs> that. <clears throat> I mean, even with my first podcast, which was a few years after doing videos and working with RTS even, I I hated it. I mean, I didn't hate being on it, but I realized like, why, how do I want to present myself? Because I'm not a researcher. You know, I don't need to have like, I study for every one of my decisions that I'm making. Um, I don't need to have a study. To, I don't need to talk about any studies. I, I mean, because the thing is, when I grew up listening and learning, it was always learning from people who were researchers and publishing science and and writing articles about that science and, and things like that. And I'm not really interested in that um, as a way for myself to communicate. I like learning in that way to some degree, but also I'm not a freaking researcher, so I don't need to present myself like a researcher, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's like an interesting thing as like figuring out how to communicate without without kind of buying into imposter syndrome, you know? Yeah. I think people, uh, what I've found is, is that, you know, having done, um, uh, I did a degree in, in sport and exercise science and um, uh, a few of my friends went on and did masters and, and that sort of stuff. And um, that just wasn't, that just wasn't for me. Um I, and then since then, you know, I've started to learn a little bit more and do a little bit more of my own research, but I like putting things across that, yes, you know, some uh, research studies and that sort of stuff are um, quite hard to, hard to digest, whereas sometimes, you know, I think people like the fact that um, those uh, in-depth research studies are put across in a, in a simple way and for how, how people to, to understand um, so that they can, they can learn. Um, and I think people prefer, I think there's too many times that people can put themselves across as quite serious all the time and, you know, straight laced. Whereas, um, how I coach, how I speak to people, um, is the, is the same with, with, you know, with everyone. I'm quite relaxed, quite, um, quite chatty and, um, yeah, not everything has to be dead, dead complicated, putting things, if someone once said, if you can make a complicated topic and put it across simply and someone understands, that's a sign of a good teacher. Um, and from, you know, speaking to the likes of such as yourself and, and other coaches, I think that's what I've tried to, to implement, which seems to be a, you know, a successful, um, a successful way to look at it, if you like. Nobody really likes to feel like they don't know as much as the person that they're talking to. Like they might think that they want to talk to somebody. I mean, you want to talk to somebody that knows more than you for sure, but you don't want to be talking to them the whole time. Like, Oh no, did the thing that I say, was that like, was that correct? Was <laughs> do they, do they respect me? You yeah. know, I mean, and some of that you're going to do anyway, to some degree at the first time, you know, if you meet somebody that you research and you listen to them all the time and you're like, Oh yeah, I hope they I hope they think that I'm smart. But the thing is like they just want to speak a lot of times they don't like the people that are really enjoyable and and have a lot of influence or whatever. They typically just want to talk to you like a human because 
they are also aware that they've been spending like 10 straight years studying this like specific thing and they don't expect anyone else to understand that like no no researcher is like oh hey guy that doesn't do the research that i do you should understand everything that i do <laughs> you know and you should you should know the things that i know because I and mean, nobody i mean nobody that nobody that anyone actually likes talks like that because that's it can come off condescending and it creates a really weird uh power position and it's really uncomfortable for both people so and and ultimately researchers don't know necessarily more <clears throat> about like they know more about their sp their field and their topic but even then the research that they're doing isn't coming to any like harsh conclusions it's just they're just adding another drop to a bucket of research that they can be yeah. used and, and, and analyzed and taken like with for a literal grain of salt. Oh, um, you know, yeah. the, sometimes uh, some research is um, for me, not always uh, practical in the, in the, in the real world. For example, um, I, uh, yeah, I am, uh, one of my one of my friends is doing his uh, his masters, and I've been helping out on it, uh, doing his study. Uh, this is this is no joke. The the study was I had to eat a really large breakfast and then go for a nap. I'm not joking. All for the purposes of science. Um, but I had to stay there five hours and have my blood taken every half an hour and and all this sort of stuff. And um, yeah, re realistically, the how how much they try to cram into that breakfast. I mean, I don't know. People might have that have that all the time, but the research they were having, it was a little bit like the end product wasn't. There was no sort of well, how would you practice this in the in the real world, whatever they whatever they were they were researching. It's like, oh well, it just gives people an idea. Well, that's not sort of um, useful for people that might not be able to that have jobs and you know are, are out day to day and everything. Um, so I think research can help, but you also need that practical world experience if you like. Yeah, well, that's kind of what it was like at the EPC, you know, and it, <clears throat> I think of it and I've more so been thinking about it a lot more recently as almost any study is like creative fuel. It's it's, a, it's an idea generation. It's a starting point. But obviously, especially in sports science, especially in powerlifting, it, it, like powerlifting specifically, there's yeah. there's not even close to enough studies to give blanket statements to give blanket uh, statements and recommendations for individuals because uh, and they talked a little bit about that too like Greg Knuckles was bringing up the fact that <clears throat> the so to, to get the right people to do the studies the, like I forget what the term he used is but to get people that are actually highly competitive to take time away from competing and then do this a study that's supposed to tell other people, what highly competitive people do and what's effective. Yeah. Was that convoluted? Did that make sense? No, no, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying it's super difficult. So it's like, okay, so we can't even get the people that we actually want to study. We can't even study the people that we want to study. We're, we're studying like proxies of those people, basically. Um, this isn't to knock science, but this is to say that, like you said, we need to acknowledge what the research is showing us but use it in you know just kind of as a starting point and then when we're experiencing the responses from individuals that we're working with we can't then say oh well the study doesn't say this should happen you know like and i don't think that many people actually do that but that made me feel good as a coach knowing that even they're just they're aware of the limitations of, of science and of research and that it shouldn't be taken as like a blanket statement. You know, they're just, they're just presenting what they found and it's more or less up to us to decide what it means. I don't know if they'd agree with it, but that's how I think about it. Well, no, I think, it, I think it's a really good point. I think, you know, I, I always like to say that everyone, everyone's got an opinion and everyone will interpret it, a, you know, a different a different way um you know the the coaches that i work with at the the gym that i, that I work at uh, we're all sort of on the same wave, wavelength but we might just say things a, a different way it's a little bit like when it comes to ex exercises i'll coach one exercise one way and another coach will coach it another way it doesn't mean to say that either way is wrong but if you put it across that the uh, so that the client or the athlete understands it and then 
gets the end result, which is to do that exercise properly or whatever it is, then right, you've both reached the same end goal. It's just a different, you've just done it in, in different ways, which, um, you know, I don't think is a, is, is a bad thing. Um, obviously, um, chatted through about there a little bit about, uh, you know, the research and, um, you chatted there about, um, you know, you yourself researching stuff and looking into, um, how to uh, do different exercises, obviously you mentioned there about the squat. Um, and obviously as a coach yourself now, the success that you've had with the, um, the power lifters and the lifters that you've worked with, you know, getting them crazy, crazy strong. When it comes to the programming for strength, what have you found to be the uh, key principles to sort of keep in, keep in mind? Um, because an example is a, a, a guy came in and um, he said, right, can you, can you teach me to be, teach me to be stronger? Can you get me stronger? I said, yes, I can, but you've got to follow, um, you've got to follow the, 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 the program sort of set out from there. So what are the principles that you, that you keep in mind when it comes to getting people strong? Um, it's an interesting, it's a good question and I have an answer, but it's going to be another long one. <laughs> um, I think, I think it, everyone needs to have a process because it, like everyone needs to have a system, uh, because if you don't have a system, then you don't, you can't get repeatable results. Yeah. But the other thing is that if you have a system for athlete right this is my system for my athletes <laughs> like i'm becoming more and more aware that every individual athlete needs somewhat of a different system to yeah. to get stronger so uh i've been thinking i thought about this while i was getting ready in the morning about like okay how do i how do i really put that in the an answer and I guess I'll just talk about like what it is like to work with me because I think that effectively would be my process or it would be my system yeah. you know so when somebody for example signs up with me uh, at any strength level you know it's really important that I get as much information about them as possible I need to know for example what equipment they have access to what what their current strength level is, whether or not they're competitive, what their main goals are, you know, because sometimes people sign up with me and they're not necessarily interested in competing. They just like getting stronger. So that requires a different communication style. It requires a bit less pressure on game day performance and it prioritizes the process a little bit more. Um, so that kind of can help me set my own framework for how to communicate with them and to, to frame the exercises and the protocols that we're utilizing with them in the appropriate way. So the, the first step in, in effect is to gather as much information as possible to try to figure out which variables that they need help with the most, yeah. because some lifters need help with technique before anything. Okay. Some lifters got the technique down, but their program structure is needs some tweaking or needs a complete overhaul or needs a bit of a, a reframe in terms of how we're thinking about progress in general, yeah. because sometimes people are, you know, I could, I could write the best program, but some people are just overshooting even their own program. Some people aren't even following the plan that they're sticking to. So, you know, that's, that's an important thing is, is figuring out what, how do I design this program that kind of meshes with their, their personality yeah. and not even like extroverted people need this program, but this person is tending to overshoot on RP nine work all the time. And I think that might be preventing them from recovering and hashtag building momentum because if you don't build momentum, then you're just kind of hitting a wall every time and you're not really getting any stronger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned about obviously you get people that so for example the, the powerlifting club that um that i run uh or the the uh, lifters that come into the gym are, are mainly beginners and none of them are, are competing just when you're talking about uh, people that uh, might be competitive or um just want to get stronger 
does the time that you potentially spend on on these areas and the goals that you get from them, the information you get them, does that dictate how long you might spend um, on different things, or will that just depend on the on the person? Such as you mentioned, that some people might need their technique working on a little bit more. Yeah, like in an ideal world, we're just like okay for the next four months, we're just going to focus on technique. Um, and that would be what I would want to do sometimes. But even then I can't do much from a lot online. You know, I can give cues every video. Like sometimes lifters will send me a video like while they're training and I'll say like, okay, for this week, let's focus on breathing better into your core. Or like I want to give them a drill so that they can practice that practice bracing effectively. And that's you. That's a lot of times what I teach because I feel like if you can get your breathing dialed in and your bracing dialed in, then everything else seems to kind of fall in place. And a a bunch of excessive cueing outside of that is also dependent on the idea that their hip structures are the same or that they feel that their physical sensation is similar to the physical sensation that I have when giving it a certain cue. So I don't do a lot of, a lot of cueing, but I I do a lot of fundamental work. Like are your feet, do your feet feel like they're on the ground? (laughs) You know, are you really maintaining stability in your in your foot when you're squatting or for the bench press are you using leg drive are you actually actively using your muscles and your legs to drive your traps into the bench pad um and for the deadlift like are you building tension are you actually spending some time breathing your core building tension on the deadlift um and and you know for some lifters like even even the strongest lifters i have uh that's something in particular with one lifter i got we've been working on for the last few weeks where it's like dude we need to build tension. We need to get this technique off of the floor improved because you're spending like eight extra seconds just trying to get the bar into position so that it can come off the floor. Or at least that's my perception. You know, I could be wrong, right? But yeah, like it doesn't really matter necessarily how advanced they are. It just kind of depends on how quickly they pick up what it is I'm saying. And that's why I love seminars because – if I go to a seminar and someone's got something going on, I can just freaking say it to them and like maybe give like a physical cue, like a physical touch or something to like the area that we're trying to work on. And all of a sudden they're just like, bam, yeah. uh, fixed. <laughs> it's like five <laughs> seconds. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I've worked for people. I work with people for months sometimes and we can't do this. Um, and that's discrediting my coaching, I think a little bit, but <laughs> the, the reality is like some things are just b- better done in person, which kind of brings me to my, my point about, how do we effectively communicate? Because if I'm talking to the lifter online and I just keep bringing up the same problem over and over and over again, and we do that for six months, like at some point it's going to probably cause some frustration. So I think in person you could just like, okay, we're focusing on technique um, because you could just physically give them a cue and then it's, it's a lot more immediate and they're not questioning whether or not it's good or bad because you're right there. So you just tell them and online, you know, I might have to wait a day or I might, be two days or something like that where they're just wondering if their deadlift technique was good. And, um, and so that's kind of the limitations of working online. So what I can control is that when I am communicating with them, what I think we should do next, uh, I've at least established enough information about them or, or developed enough information about them to speak to them in a way that I think will be the most effective. And so let's get back in terms of like what the actual process is. It's like, Okay, let's say technique isn't the problem. Let's say we think it's just programming. Well, then I need to have a really good amount of options to utilize for this person so that we can kind of start. It's, it's actually similar to, to research. Like to some degree, I've worked with a lot of lifters. You know, I, okay, not to I have. I've, I think it's got to be over 150 at this point. Um. On average, I know what happens to people when I do, let's say we have a starting template, right? For, for like a general structure, like, okay, this template we do four times a week squatting three times a week or three times a week squatting four times a week benching twice a week deadlifting, like just as a general starting point, like that's just the outline. Um, and then I look at their training history and they do something similar to that. I'm like, okay, if I implement this, it's not going to be a huge change. They're not going to have to design a new lifestyle around this. We can just stick with that. And luckily enough, that also seems to fall in line with some research that like high frequency training leads to better strength gains. Yeah. 
uh, I'm not saying that it is a truth. It's just it, it's when things are in alignment so well, sometimes you just do it because like you, you don't always want to work with someone and just shift it up because you think, you know, the answers. Like yeah. a lot of times they have a lot of, a lot of experience training and, you know, especially the athletes. So they get their, they've been training for a while. So I, for me to just come in and be like, yeah, man, everything you've been doing, is just, <laughs> it sucks. You know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Good yeah. thing you came to me. Cause I know everything, <laughs> you know, like that's just not how human humans work. And, and like, that's another thing is that like, I can have like a process technically, but psychologically, like how I communicate, I brought this up with too many times, but like, the communication of like whether or not they feel competent and what they're currently able to do is really important. So yeah. people feel competent and then they therefore are feeling like they're in control and that they've contributed to their own strength gain. So people that are waiting for the practical information are just like, dude, shut up about the psychology stuff. Um, okay. I so I have plays a part though. I think the, 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 the psychology of it does 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 play a part. Um, if the if the communication, if you speak to them the the wrong way, um, or speak to lifters the wrong way, uh, it can. I think it can have an have an effect, and I think that is something that sometimes um of, overlooked. Uh, you know, a little bit sometimes. Well, like how good of how good of a coach are you going to be if your clients don't like you? Yeah, you know, yeah. like or they think they think that. There, you can manipulate your clients. You can be a manipulative coach, right? You can get results, but make people feel bad about them or feel like they need you or feel dependent on you. Yeah. So, so like if strength is the only thing that matters, then you could potentially do it in a morally, you know, I don't know, not sound unsound, a morally unsound approach. Like people do that. That happens. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not saying it happens a lot, but it does happen. And I've worked with people when they're like, oh yeah, my old coach told me that like I, for example, talking about technique, my old coach told me if I deadlift like that, then I was going to be in a wheelchair when, in five years. Like that's not exactly something that allows for confidence in a lifter's deadlift. If they're always thinking when they're deadlifting, like, I hope I don't break my spine. <laughs> like, how are you going to get strong doing that? I like th the psychology of how you approach training is huge. It's, I'm going to rant for a second, but dude, <laughs> the amount of like times people come to me and they're like somewhat like they think all the time about whether or not they're good enough. How do you build momentum? If you're thinking every, every lift that you need, you need to be validated about whether or not it's good. Like you need to have that self confidence that that self competence and understanding that you're in control the coach is there to help and assist and not there to tell you whether or not you're good enough as a human or a lifter or whatever it is because because ultimately you are good enough and ultimately you have everything within your own control to make decisions but a coach should kind of be there to guide you to to to, to navigate you through this course that you're this path that you're deciding to go down. Right. So like my role isn't to just like decide everything. My role is to like figure out where they're at and meet and meet them where they're at, because yeah. that's going to provide more success than if I just decide like, well, here's my process and you follow my process. Yeah. Um, and I do like, I have a, a, a psychological process too. It's like actually asking them what they want to do. What are their preferences? Um, what have they had success with in the past? And I let them be usually we collaborate collaborate a little bit more again some people don't want that collaboration so i can't just yeah. say like my process is i collaborate my process is that i just let everyone work, work with the program like some people like don't say anything they give me no information and they don't want to and they just want me to give them the thing and so sometimes i just give them the thing and as long as they're tracking their their response then it's i i, ha I, I still have enough information to decide like okay look this this stress level is too much for the lifter because they're not getting stronger. Their track scores are showing that they're really fatigued. They're not telling me anything else. So when you have a lack of information, you take what you do have and you make decisions from it. Right. So, um, that stress part is probably the most important thing. I talked about it on my Instagram, actually. I don't know why I should have just pulled on my Instagram, dude. I just <laughs> literally just wrote about this and like oh, a lot more succinct way. But so the first thing I like with every athlete that I am trying to get to the point, like, is what stress level can they handle and recover from? And some 
sometimes it takes one block or two blocks, but uh, or three blocks or even four blocks. Like sometimes we, we start high and it works well. Like you start with um, a, a 20, 25 stress index. So 25 units of stress, uh, arbitrary units of stress. Um, that's derived from the exertion load equation combined with some of like Mike's own personal work with yeah. stress. And I'll, maybe I'll start there. And usually the, the training structure is something that's pretty similar to what they've done before. And if they, if they are recovering and if they're getting stronger, then I usually assume that that 26 level of stress is going to be something we can utilize. Um, and then from there, we need, we still need to have options. And so the actual protocol design, so whether or not they're doing a single out of eight on squat followed by 75% for six sets of five, uh, that might be one option. But what happens when we do that and it works? Do we do it again? Well, probably not because, uh, you know, we usually notice that people don't respond the, the same to a similar stimulus for a long time. So we got to have some other options. So maybe I'll do like next block if it worked well for that block, like a single and eight followed by 80% for a four set to four or, you know, something where we have a high, a 92% single or like an opener speed single to kind of benchmark the day. And then the volume work is maintaining that low intensity structure that po kind of polarized structure. And then, and then I have um, an alternative approach. So there's kind of like two or three ways that I go about it. You can either have a lifter that typically responds to a polarized approach. So a polarized approach is something where you're doing like a minimal high intensity, like a single out of eight, for example. And then a lot of the density is coming from low intensity volume focus work, right? So 75% six, at six, uh, six sets of five would be a great example. If they respond to that on a given movement, then I kind of stick with that concept for a few blocks. Um, usually it works for a while, right? Usually the, if they work well with that, it works for a while, but eventually something happens and, you know, maybe psychologically they need a break from that structure or they should stop responding or whatever. So maybe we move away from the polarized approach and we move more uh, closer to like a denser training style. Um, one way to do that would be maintain the single, but then the back off work is like 85, eight, uh, 86 percent, something like a set of four out of nine or, uh, as a back off. And then you do one more down set. So that's pretty high RPE work across the board. And it's usually really good for technique. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, so that's like the second route would be like high RPE across the board. Um, using singles as benchmarks. And then another option is like take away the singles. Maybe the singles are psychologically freaking them out. And we just do like high RPE uh, mid range rep work. So just a set of five out of nine, just a set of four out of nine, even, even just doubles and triples, like, but without the single, um, you know, high RPE work. So that's kind of the third one. And then potentially they don't need any, any singles at all. They don't want any intensity. Um, so we just do like six out of eight or six out of seven or work like that with a lot of volume. And that's not as common. Um, but I do find myself utilizing, especially for people who are kind of rehabbing and getting back into training with a given exercise. So those are kind of like the outlines yeah. of the, the starting points. And then like, if we know the stress, I just kind of mix and match those types of protocols and we go on until it stops working. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer it's it's just yeah kind of the why i wanted to sort of chat about the um you know the the principles of, of program for strength everything you you've chatted about there is basically getting to know the the lifter getting to know a little bit more of a background you said there about you know you can pick up a, a research study or find something out there that says you know if you follow this or if you uh, do a little bit of a linear linear progression or if you, you whatever, whatever it might be that you will you will get stronger. However, how to get people um, uh, to keep to keep getting stronger is looking at what um, what they've already done, who who that who that who that lifter is, um, and having their 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 template or a process to follow, rather than um, you know just being like right, you've got to fit into what into what I'm doing, um, uh, you know, as, as a as a coach. Do you think that 
um, you know, because there's the whole thing of sort of like cookie cutter um, programs. Do you think that's where um, people go or coaches go wrong when it comes to getting people stronger? That it's sort of the lifter has to fit into their process as opposed to, um, you know, trying to trying to work with the athlete to find out what's going to work with them for them. I mean, I'm obviously going to say, yeah, like, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I think, yes, that's usually a problem though. People can get super strong doing that too. You know, like there, there are coaches that don't really individualize training and their lifters get strong. Um, Is that a case of though you, you, um, if you get enough lifters doing it, is it for every lifter that might uh, respond well to that? Another lifter, lifter might not, or, is it just because their process might just work? I mean, yeah, I hear that argument a lot and I've used it before and it's really, it makes me feel good, you know, like, oh, well, that's just because they have enough lifters and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, ultimately it's not like every single human, every single lifter I work with works well with the, the process that we do, or, you know, maybe there are some life circumstances where they're just not in the best position to like, Maybe so. Here's not like this is the thing I think I'm trying to get to is like sometimes people's expectations about what they're capable of are here, but kind of like where their actual life structure is that would like allow them to to get really strong. It's kind of here, and yeah. so you know, I it's my my main focus is try to get them expectations to match. I mean, it's not like oh this guy's like got a crazy job, so I need to tell him that they can't get strong. It's not about that. It's more like can this athlete appreciate the the small incremental gains that they're making or do they want to be like hype city and hit 25 kilo PRs every block? Yeah. Because, you know, like there are lifters of mine who can do that to some degree, but, but that's not necessarily any better than like, I don't feel like, like Oh yeah, I'm super, I'm a super good coach because that lifter is doing that. Yeah. Um, my main focus is a, like if someone like for myself, even like if I, I'm not gunning after 20 kilo prs all the time because i travel like all the time i haven't had consistency in training in like three years like i i take what i can get when i have consistent training i'm excited i'm appreciative i'm happy that it's not injury uh, injurious i'm happy that i'm lifting in general um like i appreciate every moment if i get a little bit stronger i'm like hell yeah you know but and some lifters, I, t- I think, take, it's really difficult for them to do that when they're maybe they're not the most competitive and they have a really stressful job and they don't get a lot of sleep and they don't have a lot of consistency. Like, I'm still going to work with them. I'm going to do my best. And I don't necessarily think I'm any worse at my job if I can't get them that 50 kilo PR that they wanted because, like, I don't have control over that. Yeah. You know, they don't even have control over it, even if they had all their life structure. Like, I think what I'm trying to say is that to some degree, every coach is going to have the good lift lifters that like produce these really super cool responses. But I don't think coaching is just about getting people PRs necessarily. I mean, yeah, it is like, let's get them stronger, but is a five kilo PR any worse than a 20 kilo PR? Like given the context, like it's not for me to decide, you know, I, I, I kind of want to encourage the idea that progress in general is not, necessarily just about hitting a new PR on the squat because like if you have a non powerlifting oriented lifestyle um let's how to highly competitive powerlifting oriented lifestyle then you know maybe a few kilos every few months is a pretty sweet thing and maybe like you would reframe it and 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 enjoy lifting in general and and that means that's the key statement there, you know, enjoying it. I think once people stop enjoying anything, people won't want to do anything. And a key statement that, so every week I have a meeting with the, uh, with the coaches that I work with. And um, the, the key statement at the minute was, obviously you mentioned there about, you know, is there a difference between a five kilo PB and a 20 kilo PB? Progress is still progress. You know, um, a guy went to his first power, uh, first like sort of beginners powerlifting meet. Um, and, he got um uh, he got a seven a seven and a half kilo PB on the, on his on his deadlift and he was like oh it would have been nice to get ten and I was like that's just greedy you know you got a, you got a seven and a half PB that's fine um on the flip side of that uh, and I, I said that is progress 
on the flip side of that, somebody else um, is just for, you know, working with people who aren't powerlifting, just coming in, want to get stronger and all that sort of stuff. Um, had been really struggling with his, uh, with his diet. Um, so basically he wasn't eating enough en- enough vegetables. So we were like, right, let's try and get some uh, vegetables. Um, trying to, cause he, his staples were sort of, let's say broccoli and carrots. So I was like, right, let's add another, add, a, add another one in. Okay. So you're eating more vegetables. Um, he's gone from eating hardly, uh, just, one or two vegetables every every other meal to five consistent days in a row. So the key statement at the minute that's in the gym is progress, not perfection. You've done well. You've added you've added that back in. Um, he, he travels a lot with work, so you know he's going to struggle to be have, having consistent meals. Um, so yeah, exactly what you've said. It's just sort of making them feel uh, making them feel confident in themselves that they they are progressing. So I was told from a friend. I was trying to figure out where to live. Uh, that's what I'm currently trying to do. And um, I was just having a, a tough time with it for whatever reason. And he's like, well, uh, I don't know. He just kind of said this phrase. I don't know if it was really in context. He just said like abundance is the enemy of appreciation. And uh, I started thinking about in terms of like where to live. And I thought, yeah, because I can live anywhere. So like, I'm not really appreciating anything in particular. I'm just like looking for the best of the best of the best. And it doesn't necessarily exist because everything has problems. Everything has issues. So that kind of idea in terms of lifting is like, if you have everything going for you, then it's really difficult to appreciate all those small incremental um, improvements, whether that's to technique, whether that's to improving your mental like state when it comes to lifting, because I know a lot of people who can get really, really strong, but they're like up and down emotionally and they really aren't in maybe you know they're enjoying it when they're enjoying it when they're improving but then when they're not improving it's like almost can feel like the end of the world and and that is not necessarily sustainable and i don't think it's i mean i don't know like if that's how it is that's how it is but like i always find that people don't understand what the alternative to what it, like everything things can always get worse yeah. And I know that as a coach, I'm not like, why don't you appreciate this? Like, that's not really what I do either. Like, I still want them to get stronger because yeah. usually that's why they're hiring me. So I still need to have those options in mind. And like, I'm always going to be working on the process. I'm always going to be working on like, okay, what strategies can we utilize to help them get stronger? Right? Like, that's still something that's I'm prioritizing. I'm not just like, oh, yeah, they didn't make any PRs this year. So, uh, but at least they got mentally stronger. Like, it's not necessarily like either or, but it's like yeah. both and, right? So <clears throat> I'm still going to try to figure out a training structure that works well with an athlete that maybe they don't have like an ideal life, but yeah. that's my responsibility. Like, well, maybe they only need to train three times a week and they only need like a few hours a day. Maybe they just need like one high intensity single three times a week and that's enough. Like there are so many options to utilize and that's kind of what I, I mentioned before is that you need to have a lot of options, like a lot of options, like not just like, yeah, sometimes I use two count pause deadlifts instead of, instead of like deficit deadlifts or something. Yeah. That's not enough. Like you need like so many different permutations if you really want to be effective, because eventually you will run into situations where somebody shows up with you and they don't have like this empty slate of a schedule and you can just program everything and anything and then take away from there. Sometimes they have like an hour to train they still want to be competitive. Uh, my mind, it might be like, oh, okay, but I don't, uh, like sometimes to me, how many, I just don't know a lot of hot top level lifters with, a, with a lifestyle like that. Yeah. But if that's what they want to do, I'll start with that expectation and I'll start as that as a benchmark for my own performance as a coach and see if we can implement it. And I'll do my freaking best that I can do. Right. Yeah. So I can't necessarily tell them what their goals are. I think looking and that is actually kind of my main point is I'm sorry, I guess my main point is that I need to make sure I know what their goals are. And so I can't just assume I can't assume anything. Yeah. Okay. I have to I have to ask anything I don't understand and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, you, yeah, the the screen paused a little bit, so I was just a little bit like Oh no! I, uh, <laughs> I thought you were gonna make you were making a really good point then. So I was like, no, don't freeze. Uh, oh, oh, is yeah. it all good? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, still there. I just wanted to. That's why I just wanted to double check. Um, okay. Yeah, that is a you know is a it is a good point. It's um, uh, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it's a lot more of um, listening to the listening to the um, 
uh, athlete and then you know asking them questions to get to get more information and um, exactly like you said you know you need a plan b and then if plan b doesn't work right well then you need plan plan c as well uh, just just to be able to to work through work, work through it and get them to there. it might there might be occasions with you know like you say not necessarily maybe the, the higher end athletes but you know people who are trying to get a little bit more competitive um, it might be that uh, for whatever reason work get works get in the way right well i've only got an hour to be able to do this or whatever it may be um when you chatted there about sort of uh, you've you've found out all the uh, information their lifestyle how can they train previous training how do you sort of um evolve through the process and look at um changing the um changing the blocks you know if they're if they're, if they're not used to that um and you know what about uh, how much sort of experimenting um goes on as you're evolving and, and working with a with a lifter so I, I know you had mike on here before i don't know if you talked about this type of thing or not um but we at rts we utilize block reviews and meta block reviews pretty heavily yeah. to at least help inform us it's it's like our own reviewing structure again it's it's almost similar to like a study like it's just that study is actually about the individual right so we still have to look at it and and okay tell what what is the data telling us because this is the data that we have so you know unless we just want to only utilize our biases then we should look at the data and with respect and and make decisions from there so um the block reviews are really helpful because it can kind of tell us like the first block review isn't going to be particularly helpful it's yeah. going to tell us whether it went well or not it's not going to tell us why however from there then i can look at it and, and kind of maybe use that's when i would be like hey look this is what what happened in this block I will typically ask them what they thought was the biggest com contributor to either the progress or to the uh, lack of progress. Okay. So I'll be like, Hey, look, here's what I'm typically looking for. Did you get enough sleep? Did you get enough? Like, was your food on point? Uh, did you do proper, you know, did you warm up properly in a way that you usually do or was it all over the place or like, was your mind in it? Are you even bringing any intention to the gym? I mean, I don't say it like that. But like, <laughs> like, are you bringing that kind of attention? Like, what do you think? Yeah. And then they'll tell me what their experience was like that like four or five, six weeks and, and what they thought was kind of contributing. And then I'll take that information. And then, uh, so I'll combine that with a block review. And then I will take what I kind of personally think I should do and see how much of that aligns. So if that is aligned with what they're thinking, if that aligns with what the block review is showing, and if it's aligned with my own weird biases that I have of my own experiences, then I'm like, sweet. I think we got an answer. I think we should try tempo work, for example. I think that their technique needs a bit of improvement. The tempo work tends to help with propri proprioceptive awareness. Um, such a fun word to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, so like, for example, that, that might be something. like the, the alignment of the athlete's preferences and thoughts with the block review with my own if we can get all of those in alignment, then that typically helps with that. Not even adherence, but um, like motivation, like des deciding that this actually is a really solid approach and that we can feel confident at least moving forward with it. Yeah. And knowing that like the athlete has to kind of understand that it is a process of understanding what works for them, not just like a process that works. Right. So it's not like just shut up athlete. Like you just do your thing. Don't say anything. And, and we'll all figure it out. Like it, having them involved in understanding that it's about them. Um, I think that can make it fun. Again, not everyone wants to do that. Some athletes do just want to keep quiet and let me do my thing. But I do find that when you combine some of that preference and get them to start thinking a little bit more about the program, um, that active awareness can help make everything else even more effective. Because if someone's like, Oh, I'm going to do this. I, I was thinking, Hey Jim, I was thinking, uh, do you think we could do some like, Angles this block because I haven't done that in a while. I'm like, oh yeah, actually, I was thinking of implementing that as well. And then, hey, the block review we did a one block for fucking two years ago with singles, and it went really well. I don't know why it took me two years to realize that, yeah. <laughs> but we're gonna do it. You know, yeah. so um, that's kind of like how we fine tune it. Is that we always kind of revert back to asking questions, um, looking at the block reviews, and then again, I I need to have some relative creative fuel as well because <clears throat> I need to start thinking like, well, what about this? Could we try this? Like, oh, I know someone that's doing this. Um, I think a really good example is um, I have a lifter who is really, really strong and kind of in the past has bought into 
do you want a case study right now? I have a case study, but it, oh, yeah. it's going to be decently long. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to find it interesting. Now, sometimes we get that I am doing a, a podcast when I, when I start speaking to people, but yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, sick. Okay, so here's this. Here, here's the context. I start working with a guy, super strong, um, has at one point done like two-a-day training. And if he's listening to this, he'll know it's him. Um, <laughs> two-a-day training. Like he was doing like crazy volume, like six days a week. He was training at one point 13 days a week. I mean, that doesn't – 13 <laughs> times a week. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. he, just made his, he just made up a whole different week. <laughs> <laughs> 13 days a week. Like he's like, you know what? Mondays are not the end of the week. Sundays are not. I'm, it's Monday too. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, he was training like crazy. And then I think he, he just told me he had done that. He hadn't done that in a little bit, but he had done that. Um, and then we start working together and I'm like, okay. So he responds to all the volume. So I'm going to give him a lot of volume. He was responding really, really well to that. But at some, he's also had a lot of experience with like back pain and like various things. He's got that, uh, I don't know what, I forget what it is, fibromyalgia. Malaysia. Um, I'm going to sound like an idiot to people that know this, but basically it's like a, a more or less a neurological, like, I don't know if it's a disease, but typically these people have higher sensitive neuro, um, their pain sense sensitivity is higher. Right. So like they'll have more common like elbow tendonitis and then things where they're just like irritated, like, like that. So anyway, long story short, that started happening and I'm like, okay, so what can we do? Because this guy's still really strong and he's got everything else in place. He just kind of has some pain overall. And my understanding about pain is that it typically is related to uh, too much stress and not enough recovery. So how do we kill the stress? Well, typically that means killing some volume. And so we chipped away at the volume, we chipped away at the volume, and he's still getting stronger, even though we keep taking volume away, um, like significant amounts, like from six sets of five to three sets of five to two sets of five to one set of five. And block after block, we're just kind of doing that for, for various movements. We, get, we went from squatting three times a week to squatting once a week um, and yeah. doing one split squat a week. And Deadlifting three, uh, twice a week to deadlifting once a week and benching four times a week to benching three times a week. Yeah. Just, dude, like completely, completely just shifting and then just chipping, chipping, chipping away because it's like, look, if you're still getting injured but you still want to train, then we need to match that stress to the recovery. Yeah. So we kept doing that. And at this point, we're doing, hmm. I don't want to tell. Actually, I can't tell. It's a secret. But let me, <laughs> let me just say that we're doing – pretty much no volume, just heavy singles um, on, the, on the lower body movements because those are the spinal loaded movements and those are the ones that he seems to be irritated with. We're doing one heavy single for the squat, one heavy single for the deadlift, and uh, one supplemental movement for the, like, the legs uh, to get some volume in. We also not noticed that his, he was getting super fatigued from high rep leg work, which, uh, by the way, is something I kind of – was observing and then Eric Helms was talking about in his presentation at the EPC that an individual who has more muscle mass, the more muscle you grow will change the insertion angle of that muscle to the joint. And as a result, a bigger muscle can potentially occlude more blood, which hypothetically also increases the fatigue per rep for bigger people. And I was noticing this thing with this lifter and I was like, Hey, look, I don't, maybe we don't need a bunch of high rep work because every, it, we would do like a set of 10 at like an RPE six and he was just wrecked, you know? So I'm like, okay, maybe we just don't want that many reps in the program. Uh, so I'm going to take those out. <laughs> so yeah. we don't have anything over six right now for his lower body work. And um, I don't know, long story short, like we just kind of went from this starting point to more information. He's not recovering. He's awesome, by the way, because he's like, some people just buy into paradigms that are not actually substantiated, like this high volume paradigm. Like I need volume or my muscles are going to get small. It's like, and I, and there's, cause there's so much research to indicate that that might be true, but they're ignoring these other variables. Like you can't recover from it. So it doesn't matter how much volume you need. You're not recovering. And so we need to adjust the plan. Like that's just how it is. And, and so it's kind of my job to kind of, to communicate that 
but it's a lot easier when the athletes also understand the what studies are for you know and i'm i've bought into that idea relatively strongly too because um i used to do a similar training approach as this guy four days like i said four days of training a week three squat four bench two deadlifts and now i i'm pretty much doing what uh this guy's doing i'm doing a with more volume, I'm doing actually more volume than him now, which is hilarious because <laughs> he fucking train three, 13 days a week at one point. But, you know, um, yeah. It, yeah, you know, the point is that that process evolves based on the information and, uh, and understanding like which variables are impacting one another. And that is important for the, co- like the athlete doesn't need to know that yeah. they can, you can, they might, this person does. And it's important that they understand it, but yeah. you know, I understand the relationship between stress, volume, intensity, and, and, and how that can impact their performance. And so it's, it's ever evolving. Like it's literally ever evolving because no one that I've started with is doing the same thing that they're doing two years later. You know, we're just shifting things up because they're, they're getting bigger and now they're getting more fatigued from the same level of work or whatever it is. And um, even if you don't know that science, like, actually they're just not responding to the stimulus anymore. So we should change it. Yeah. I think when you're saying there, you know, if people are, if, if in two years time, people are doing the same things, it's the exact same thing. Um, well, yeah, as a, as a coach, things will change in, in, in two years, you know, they'll progress, uh, things will happen, you know, uh, obviously, you know, worst case, they might get an injury and you got to change it around or, you know, you might need, the, the better they get, you might need to ch- change it around a, li- a little bit more. Um, and in terms of in terms of the research, I think you know we touched on it, pre- uh, you know, previously in this chat. Um, people can look at the research and be like, oh well, that's that's what I need to do. But actually, yeah, if like what you said about the volume, if you're absolutely battered after after doing loads of volume, right? Well, yes, this is the what the research says, but that's not really relevant re- relevant to you. Um, the uh, how I liked it. I did a, a, a podcast with um, Mike Isretel and uh, how he explained about the exercise selection, you know, does it take long to set up? How much do you recover from it? What's the actual benefit that you get from it? Um, and I think that's a really good way to look at it. Um, so when you were, when we're thinking about, you know, um, getting people or getting powerlifters to um, progress and get stronger and, you know, go from sort of regional comps to nationals, nationals to progress. Is that the um, uh, the way to go? And, the, you know, because you always think, oh, well, how did someone go from competing at this to adding X amount onto the total? Is it just evolving that process all the time? Is that the, um, the, the, the way to go about it rather than people thinking, oh, well, um, did this guy just uh, put on put on 25 kilos went up a weight class and that's why that's why he's ended up getting uh, getting to you know the, the next level if you like is that is that what you would think i mean i'm so process focused that like like as a coach i am probably more process focused than like anyone that i know um because in my mind if we don't have a good process then it doesn't matter what happens like in one day you know, because then we don't have a process to figure out how that happened. Um, yeah, I, I think it's less about that, like, quick fix, because even if you do get a quick fix, like, let's take this to the extreme, okay? Because why not? You know, hashtag polarizing. Um, um, if we take drugs, if we take a bunch of steroids, and an athlete gets adds 100 pounds to their total, even that isn't forever, you know, and, and, and they add more and more risk to injury because of the extra inflammation, extra, the extra just inputs uh, and stress that they have on their body from the extra load that they're lifting because now they're, they're lifting a lot more weight. Yeah. Um, and that might add a hundred pounds right now. Uh, but, but I'm, and I'm not necessarily saying that they won't continue to get stronger just doing that, but I don't know that it will. And I do know that, Big changes in a short amount of time tend to be difficult to maintain to some degree, you know, like, and again, I, I'm not saying that if you get a hundred pounds stronger that you won't just stay that it's not just going to go away, yeah. but it does mean that you're then changing the organism. You're changing the function of the organism. So the variables that are contributing to that hundred pound gain may not sustain that organism forever. And so even if you do find a block that's sick uh, and you just, 
just get crazy strong. Like yeah. that happens a lot where I added 30 pounds to my bench press in, in four weeks. Like, how did I do that? And can I do that every single block? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't really matter to me because the process doesn't change. Like, okay, that was a sick block. You did really well. What do you think contributed? I think it was this. I think it was uh, my, my mental motivation was there. Um, and it was never there before. I've never thought that much about my training before. And so I gained 30 pounds. Well, now that you're thinking about training, that 30 pounds might have been the re- like, you might have gained 30 pounds on your squat because you never brought any intention to the squat. And now you are. But now that you're bringing intention to the squat, that's a variable that isn't like you that can't then contribute to an extra 30 pounds just like that. So yeah. Um, what I'm, what I think I'm really trying to say is like, yes, we always have a process focus. Like it's always like asking again, what are the variables that are contributing? What is the block review saying? And, and sticking to the variables that are working for sure. Like if something's working, like keep going, keep going and until it stops. But, uh, you know, anything can happen too. Like the training structure might be the training structure that's really, really good, but life stress increases, you know, something else happens and, I think athletes that don't have a lot going on other than lifting are going to be like, dude, I don't have anything going wrong with my life. So shut up. Like, (laughs) tell me, tell me the, the, tell me the thing that gets me strong and shut up. Um, that's totally fair too. Like if an athlete doesn't have all these variables that are changing all the time, then it is just that training process that we dial in. It's just best exercises, best volume structure, best strategy, like for sure. Um, but yeah, any, any kind of like, I want to get super fast, strong, uh, super fast strengthy. And so I'm going to hire this coach that knows all the keys. It's like, maybe, you know, maybe you do work with me and you get really strong and that's awesome. But my prioritization is figuring out a process that is repeatable. Yeah. Um, to keep getting that person stronger, you know, which yeah. is we've, we've spoken about this throughout it. And I had to laugh when you, when you mentioned about intention there, because, um, it's no secret that my, my bench is my, is my worst exercise. Um, that's because I don't really enjoy bench press, uh, leading up to a competition. I, well, I've started, I start seeing physios now, um, leading up to competition and um, my shoulders get beat up and yeah, I'm not very, I'm not very good at it. Um, but obviously, um, right the the bench is is what's dropping my total down we need to have like you say a little bit more intention and uh when you mentioned that i had to smile to myself because now that i'm showing a little bit more intention on my bench press squatting and deadlifting i love you lifting big weights you know i think both of those exercises are cool they look cool with loads of plates on the bar bench press oh well i'm not that strong at it so oh, let's just get bench press out of the way and let's get to anything else um showing a little bit more intention on it I am starting to see progress on my uh, on my bench, which um, you know that's just from saying. Um, so I, my coach is uh, Mark McQueen, um, and working with him, and it was basically look, you need you, you need to put a little bit more uh, intention, put a little bit more effort into it, and that was no sort of with me having lack of sleep or uh, I couldn't get the sessions in. It was basically mainly because it's not my favourite lift. I'm not going to do it. Put it back in. And it started to improve. Um, so yeah, I com- you know I completely uh, agree with you know sometimes different things can happen in that block. But like you say, if you find a training uh, a training process that's like right, this block you've got crazy strong. Um, right, let's see how this goes. Um, so yeah, completely completely agree with what. You <laughs> well, it's like those. So I think the point that I was trying to get there is that there are certain variables that, when actually paid attention to, will produce a pretty significant response. Yeah. You know, like. If you lack sleep and then all of a sudden you figure out how to sleep more, then for the short term, that was going to probably produce a pretty significant response to your strength in the lifts. But um, I think a lot of people are hearing, m- might be hearing me say like, just focus on all these other variables that aren't lifting. And like, that's not true. It's just that if those variables are lacking, then that's going to have an impact. But then once you fix them, it's not. So then what do you do? Well, then you actually look at the program yeah. <laughs> Then you actually look at the training variables and then and, and I think that's where I want to make sure I'm clear is that some athletes actually have everything dialed in and then you definitely need to have this process of training. And that's where the optionality is probably the biggest thing. Like if one, if any coaches listening to this are working with athletes that have everything freaking dialed in, um, then it is ultimately up to you to figure out the various training styles because that 
is going to have a pretty significant impact on their training once those other variables aren't there. So, you know, do they respond well to polarized training? Do they need a little bit more volume? Do they need a little bit more stress? You know, like I said, find the stress level that works first, and then you can implement the protocols within that stress level that can be, there can be crazy options there. You know, just the, the amount of creativity that you can utilize for various protocols is insane. And I think people and coaches need to be more comfortable not making stuff up, but like deciding for themselves that like they want to do a triple out of eight for 200 down sets, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just having that, like as an option, at least give, like give respect to a lot of different things. I think a lot of people are like, not this, not this, not this, not this, because of, yeah. you know, West side's horrible. And like, why would you ever use bands and chains ever? There's no reason to use it. And it's like, because, they might work like i don't know just do it because like eventually you're just gonna well you're only gonna mess with rep ranges yeah. like that's boring you know eventually people just want to have fun and that maybe that's the variable that that works and yeah. i don't know I, I, I never really know the variable that works i just know that i give myself a lot of freedom to choose and to create um i mean a job the most most difficult part about coaching is actually the creative process that you engage in because you need a lot of mental energy to prevent yourself from just like doing the same thing all the time. Yeah. And it's looking at the, you know, everything that you've chatted about there, which I quite like is looking at it from a, like a global uh, aspect, if you like. And then, you know, if right, once you can uh, process of elimination, all these are in line. Um, right. This is the, this is the area that we need to need to focus on. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, quite a lot of things. Exactly what I wanted from uh, having you on uh, uh, on the podcast. Um, yeah, really, really uh, interesting. And you know, following the content that you put out there, uh, and to be able to chat with you sort of um, reaffirms everything. You know, that I've, I've followed the content that you're putting out there. Um, so for everyone listening, obviously, plenty of tangents, plenty of, of topic of topics covered. Um, what would for everyone listening, either as a as a just a powerlifter or as a as a coach listening, what would be your take home points or words of wisdom from everything that we've chatted about today? I would say the big big three are going to be uh, allow yourself to be creative, allow yourself to kind of think outside of the box, and like not like outside of the box. I looked at another study, like within your own head, yeah. what have you kind of observed? What have you seen? And can you implement implement that with your lifters? Number two is make sure you're asking the right questions and, and, and listening first, asking questions first before interjecting and deciding what's best for the lifters. Because if you don't know what the lifter wants and you don't know the context of the lifter, then you're going to miss a lot and you're probably going to make the relationship, uh, the relationship will slow down and that's impacts their performance. And then um, Three is if you are a coach or if you're an athlete and you don't feel comfortable or confident right now, uh, you're going to look six years in the future and think like, if I don't start now, then I'll not be any different. But if I start now and accept that I'm probably going to suck a little bit, that's okay. And it's almost expected because you just started. So, you know, give yourself some time to grow and adapt and evolve and learn and trust that you can learn and that you will learn and that the things that you do learn, you can apply to more and more and more people as you kind of go through that process of evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Good points to good points <laughs> to, to finish on. Um, yeah. So for everyone listening um, who uh, after listening to the awesome chat that we've done, <laughs> um, where can people find you, get in touch with you or, or follow the content that, that you're putting out there? Uh, you can find me mostly on Instagram. Uh, my own page is Jim J I M underscore R T S. And then the R T S Instagram is reactive training systems. Um, those are probably the main places. And if you don't follow our reactive training systems on YouTube, uh, now is the best time in all of R T S history to follow us because I am more or less establishing a 4k standard, which means all the videos I'm trying to upload in 4K, at least as many as I can. Um, audio is pretty dialed in. I'm getting really good at editing. So just <laughs> like speaking of processes, man, I'm I'm getting I'm be, I'm going to become like one of the best videographers in YouTube in the next six years. So 
don't sleep on me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to send these podcasts over to you, and then you can, yeah, yeah if you've yeah. got uh, better editing skills. <laughs> um, 100% everyone listening, uh, look at the work that Jim and, and RTS do. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. I know it's helped me, not just as a, as a lifter myself, but as a, as a coach. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time uh, to chat with me, Jim. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the chat as much as I did, and I will see you all next week. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it.